en Santiago. Um, me siento como representante de la raza. Ella habla por mis fotografías. Ella es aquí. Now this magazine, Oi, which published some of Chambi's photographs at the same um, next door to this quote and a larger article, provided Chambi um, with a platform, you know, to talk about indigenous culture in a country renowned precisely for not talking about these issues. Um, the Chilean press consistently underscored the artistic quality of Chambi's work, particularly the way in which he played with light and shadow um, in his photographs. It also, almost without exception, emphasised Chambi's indigenous identity. Um, again, I'll let you read through these um, for yourselves. Um, it's interesting it's from some of the different quotes, the, um, the different ways in which identity is seen you know, and it, um, it, or expressed, that it can be through experience and vivir lado a lado con los hombres de su raza. In other occasions, la nación, is, la nación for example, the third quote, the nación is very key, uh, keen to stress that he's a, you know, an authentic indigenous person and, they go, and he goes back to his you know, physio physiological features. Um, <coughs> now, the title of um, Chambi's photography exhibition in Santiago was Motivos de Cusco. As presented by most newspapers in Chile at the time, it was the Antiguo, the Historico, and the Viejo Cusco that visitors would discover in Chambi's photographs. Chambi himself became the photographer, the photographer of Inca, Peru, um, the photographer of the Patria de Atahualpa, here in the fourth quote. So in short, um, Chambi and Peru's indigeneity um, no, was often depicted as a thing of the past, of the pre-Columbian um, past. But this is not so particular to Chile, no? I mean, this is also how, the, uh, the, if, we go, if we look at the Peruvian press of Chambi's exhibitions at the same time, it also spoke about Chambi and his work in very similar ways. Um, and we can say, for example, that the photos that were exhibited in Chile, and we, have a, we do have a list of the photographs that were exhibited in Chile, the most of them um, like, yeah, do focus on the natural landscapes and on the architecture of um, Cusco and on, on the ruins of Machu Picchu, and there's photos like El Indio y Sujama. But these were also the kind of photos, so not the photos of street protests, no, not the more complicated photos of Chambi, but these were also the photos that were being exhibited in Peru at the same time. It was also, those were also the photos that galleries in Peru um, wanted to see. Um, one last point um, that I want to say with regard to this slide and um, the reception of Chambi's photographs of indigenous Peru is it's very interesting to me to see what happens with the histories or the symbols of the glorious Inca past. Um, there's many more things that I could say about his representations of indigenous Peru and Chile, but I'll limit myself to this, and then I have one more slide, and then I've finished. Um, so in the early 19th century, there was a sense um, of a shared ownership of this glorious Inca past. You know, that Chileans and Peruvians alike, and Bolivians and Argentinians and so forth, um, could claim inspiration from this glorious Inca past. It was something available, if you like, to all Americanos. This changed with the War of the Pacific in the late 19th century, um, when in um, particularly um, in dominant discourse in Peru, and I've mainly looked at it through the press, no, but where the Inca becomes something that's exclusive to Peru, that's only about Peru. And that is articulated in direct opposition to Chile. What's interesting is that sometimes it's articulated in direct opposition to the Araucanos Chilenos, and there's this distinction between Inca Peru and Araucanian um, Chile. In the early 20th century, in the context of Chambi's visit to Chile, um, we see this kind of discourse shift again. And it's not so much that the Inca civilization is transformed back into a universal treasure, it remains, as articulated by the Chilean press, something that's distinctly Peruvian. But rather, it was no longer set in opposition to Chile. 
Chileans could celebrate that glorious Inca past. They could celebrate it as part of their neighbors, their friendly neighbors' history. They could appreciate it from a distance, or they could travel to Peru to see it close up. And this is precisely what the um, Chambi's photography was supposed to be doing. They were promoting um, Chilean tourism in Peru. After Santiago, um, Chambi traveled to southern Chile, to Temuco, Osorno, Valdivia, and Puerto Montt. As reported by one newspaper of Puerto Montt, he had come with the aim of capturing beautiful panoramic views of the region. And it said, Con las fotografías que obtenga, piensa hacer una gran propaganda en favor del turismo chileno, para lo cual ha encontrado el apoyo decidido e entusiasta del Departamento de Turismo. <coughs> um, Chambi, it seems, um, was keen to take on the role of cultural ambassador for Chile in Peru, as well as for Peru in Chile. Chambi himself told La Nación of Santiago that he wanted to go to southern Chile specifically to estudiar la vida de los araucanos. Recounting um, the highlights of Chambi's trip shortly before he returned to Peru um, in May 1936, um, Zigzag remarked, El señor Chambi visitó también el sur de Chile, donde captó interesantes motivos de la vida de nuestros aborígenes, y trae numerosas fotos de la región de los lagos que por su, por su hermosura y variedad le han brindado suficiente para hacer a su regreso a Perú una exhibición de las inmensas bellezas que existen en la zona central. Now, um, I have not yet found any evidence of this exhibition taking, of such an exhibition taking place back in Peru. Um, but at least as narrated here by Zigzag, um, when Chambi um, got back home, or, or rather, or as, as Zigzag narrates it, the chili that Chambi was going to promote when he got back home to Peru was not the modern or supposedly progressive nation to be found in the capital city, Santiago. It was the awe-inspiring natural landscape of southern Chile, historic Mapuche territory. The human protagonists um, that Peruvian audiences were going to encounter were nuestros aborígenes. Now, faced with this visual record, government officials would, we could say, not be able to deny the existence of, Chile, of indigenous peoples in Chile, as they had famously done on so many occasions. Um, as depicted by Zigzag, moreover, it does not seem um, that government officials ever tried to deny the existence of indigenous peoples. Indeed, it was the government that funded and arranged for Chambi's trip to southern Chile. Now, the choice of words, nuestros aborígenes, um, obviously suggests a very colonial relationship. No, but it also intimates acceptance that Peruvians might come to think of Chile as an indigenous country. Um, and with that, if I just I want to say two, a couple of things as how, um, summing up then, the significance of Chambi's trip to Chile in 1936 and how it links back to the, the, bigger, um, the bigger project. Um, so I think Chambi's visit to Chile um, and I really have done it a disservice, there's so much more to say about it, but it really brings home the very entangled nature of Chilean-Peruvian intellectual relations, or Chilean-Peru relations more broadly. No? It's, he is an excellent example of what we could call a cross-border agent. His trip, his photographs, his discussions about his photographs take us beyond the nation-state, um, but they also, and this is what I think is important, bring us back to the nation state um, in terms of thinking about the relationship between intellectuals and their respective states, um, and also about the relations of cultural diplomacy between states. And finally, um, I think Chambi's trip to Chile and the debates um, that ensued indicate, um, to my mind in some ways, the potentially overlapping nature of discourses of nationalism, Americanismo, and indigenismo, and to not, and that we don't, shouldn't always see them, especially nationalism and Americanismo, as you know, mutually exclusive. And there I'll stop, and I spent a lot more time than I intended to, so it's only about 10 minutes left. <laughs> Six years ago in Bolivia, I saw this slogan, Elibra etc. 
acceso al mar es un derecho, conquistarlo es un deber. Would Chile and Peru ever consider the stream of the Bolivian brothers? Um, you mean the government? Or whoever. <laughs> so the mean, people make up the nation. Yes. Right? Um, so yeah, I don't talk about Bolivia here at all, but it's very difficult to talk about Chile and Peru without talking about <laughs> Bolivia as well, especially when we're talking about the wars of the 19th century. Um, I don't know, all I can really say is I think in Chile there seems to be, um, and maybe Chileans could corroborate or disagree on it, there seems to be a great debate about what to do about the question of the access to the sea, yeah. Bolivian access to the sea. Um, people do speak, seem to talk about it quite openly. Um, I don't think I have any sense that the government, though, is mm -hmm. ever going to do anything about it. But I don't know, there's probably people who know a lot more than that. In, but, so that's just my view from reading the Chilean newspapers. Um. <laughs> yeah, following up on his comment, but I have my own question. <laughs> I remember I was in Bolivia, uh, and, and also in Chile. In Chile, they told me, is it? only way the expletive Bolivians would ever get access to the mar is it, to the sea is if they poured water into Lake Titicaca and, and, and it expanded <laughs> to the sea. But there, but there is a, uh, an accord, uh, some, mm. some sort of governmental accord that gives Bolivia access to the sea, but not giving them territory. You not give them territory, but it, giving them kind of trade yeah, access to okay, the, yeah. The question is, you know, I never knew that, uh, I heard of Gabriela Mistral, a poet laureate of Chile, et cetera, but I never knew that she was considered a hija de Atualpa, and she was more noted for being of uh, African ascendancia. And I was just wondering, in her poetry, you said it didn't reflect anything about indigenous, and she's probably a mixed race, obviously, but did she write anything about Africa, or, uh, or negritud, sort of, sort of thing? Um. Well, one of the things about Gabriela, in a similar, we could talk about Gabriela Mistral's ethnic elasticity, you know, like we can with Ga um, Chambi, in the, to different people, and in different instances, she said very different things about her ancestry. And what she, so at some, a lot of the time she talks about um, the importance of her Basque ancestry, for example. At other points, it's her indigenous, uh, but it's different. It's a different indigenous ancestry. So sometimes she talks about the Mapuche, but sometimes it's Quechua, or sometimes she's Atacameña. Um, she doesn't talk very much about her own African ancestry, if there is one. I'm just, I'm thinking about. Um, Licia Fiolmata's book, Queer Mother of the Nation on Gabriela Mistral, and she, she develops a very interesting idea about Gabriela Mistral and the way she works with the state and the way she manipulates her kind of mestizo identity, particularly after she goes to Mexico and particularly when she works with Vasconcelos. But she, um, Licia Fiolmata, um, actually talks a lot more about Gabriela's racism towards black people um, and also in the context of Mexico Chinese too so that you know so when she, so and like and she marks this distinction between an acceptance of an indigenous heritage and the very negative ways in which she talks about people of African descent um, but again that's just one interpretation of Gabriela Mistral and it's particularly um, Fiona Mata particularly analyzes it in the, um, in the context of conversations between Gabriela Mistral and the Mexican Alfonso Reyes, and talks about his racism too. Um, but with, with Gabriela Mistral, I think you can find so many different things in her, depending on what you read mm -hmm. and when it was written. And I think to a certain extent, you know, she plays the game a little bit and says what she thinks people want to hear at the time. Uh, recent uh, ups 
surge of migration from Peru to Chile is going to affect how Chileans will hear this research and respond mm. to it, or vice versa. You know, we're, without reducing it just to the border problem. Mm. Yeah, it provides a useful contemporary context, isn't it, into which yeah. to articulate, into which to have these kind of discussions. Um, and again, I think, um, just knowing very brief response to that, and maybe it's not really a very, in, um, a, um, a very considered response. I need to think about this a bit more. Um, but I th and there's a lot of very interesting work no, on the racist discrimination that Peruvian migrants in Chile and particularly in Santiago feel that they have suffered, um, particularly Peruvian migrants um, who've worked as domestic servants in Santiago. But again, I also see, and maybe this is, I'm always trying to find a more positive story, I also see um, quite an open debate about that in Chile and the way in which Peruvian um, migrants are being treated. And, but at the same time, you have this real auge in our celebration of Peruvian food, for example, and in Santiago, in all different areas of Santiago, um, you can find Peruvian, rest, you know, Peruvian restaurants. Um, so I think there's lots of different things going on. There's, I, think you can, I think in that contemporary context, you can talk about antagonism and hostility, but you can also talk about moments of conversation and coming together. Eh, de la emigración de peruanos en Chile y el impacto que, que, que producen los peruanos en Chile por alguna otra razón. Lo que pasa es que exceden a digamos, los límites temporales que tú estás estudiando. Mm. Pero un caso muy, muy interesante es el del músico Sergio Arrido Leca. Eh, es un músico digamos, formado en el conservatorio, es un músico eh, formado en música clásica. Y él va a Santiago eh, en los años 60 y es nada menos el, que el fundador de, me parece que Inti Limani o Quilapayún, uno de estos dos grupos que fueron muy populares en el movimiento latinoamericano de izquierda de los años 60. Él, eh, eh, sé que él, eh, digamos, fue muy, muy impactante en Chile y, y intuyo que la creen, que una un estudio de la prensa y archivos, eh, mm. de la influencia que tuvo Garrido Leca en digamos, la música popular andina, mm. que en Chile fue tan exitosa, sí. con los jarcas, sí. los jaivas y todo eso. Digamos que hay un peruano detrás mm. ahí, sí. eso es muy interesante. ¿Cómo se llama? Celso Garrido Leca. Eh, bueno, después te lo puedo mandar. Ahora, eh, digamos, el, el, el caso de peruanos en Chile está muy claro el, el caso al revés sí, es más complicado sí, sí, sí. El, el, el impacto eso no está tan claro sí. pero hay un ejemplo un ejemplo, bueno, tardío para tu época, mm. pero maravilloso conmovedor que es en 1987 eh, se cae un avión con todo el equipo de jugadores de la Alianza Lima mm -hmm. la Alianza Lima mm. es el equipo de fútbol más importante de, de Perú, uno de los más importantes del mundo, cuando se cae el avión, se mueren todos los jugadores y la primera reacción internacional 